Way back in 1987, Apple released their Knowledge Navigator video, which demonstrated their vision of what a future conversational agent might look like. The six minute video depicted the interaction between Mike, a professor, and Phil, his agent. It opens with Phil reading Mike's messages to him to start the day. At one point, Mike reaches over, taps the screen to make Phil stop talking and sort of fills in the blank. Oh yeah, surprise birthday party next Sunday. The conversation continues and they start talking about Mike's workday with Phil saying, oh, you have a lecture coming up at 4.15 about deforestation in the rainforest. Mike says, pull up my lecture notes from last semester. And Phil does so. Then Mike says, eh, that's not enough. Pull up all the new articles I haven't read yet. And Phil here demonstrates a very strong knowledge of Mike and his history and that it's implied that Phil knows what Mike has previously read. And Phil also demonstrates some strong knowledge of the academic world in that Phil knows to then clarify journal articles only. Phil then continues to go on and say, your friend Jill has published an article about deforestation. Mike's like, oh yeah, great. Contact Jill. Let's talk about this. Phil pauses and then says, she's not available. I left a message on your behalf. So they keep talking. Mike says, oh, there was an article about five years ago by Dr. Flemson or something. I think he disagreed with Jill. Phil helpfully jumps in and says, John Fleming. Mike's like, yeah, that's it. I'll need to recheck his predictions. And Phil says, oh, here are the deforestation rates he predicted, pulling in data, popping up charts on the screen from John Fleming's recent research. Mike says, oh, and then what happened? And then Phil jumps in, excuse me, Jill Gilbert is calling back. And what's really interesting about this interaction right here is that later in the video, Mike's mom calls during a conversation and Phil knows to screen that call and take a message rather than bringing her in. In this case, Phil can follow the conversation thread well enough to know that a conversation with Jill is relevant to what they're doing. So Phil interrupts and um, accepts the call from Jill. So now Jill joins the conversation. It's this three-way interaction now. Jill says, oh, hey, Mike, what's up? Mike says, rumor has it, you've put out the definitive article on deforestation. And Jill sort of chuckles and says, oh, this sounds like one of your typical panics for last minute lecture material. Mike says, no, 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 that's not until... And he sort of trails off. And Phil helpfully chimes in to answer this unspoken question and say, 4.15. As in, your lecture is at 4.15. So then Jill shows her simulation for work she's been doing. The screen sharing works flawlessly compared to today. And Mike says, that's great. I have another map. Let's see if we can put this together. And at this point we see Mike reach down and touch the screen and sort of drag these two blobs together. And then Phil takes that and compiles the data instantly into this new analysis and animation showing the compiled data from Jill and Mike. So as we watch this video, we're thinking this kind of human agent teaming seems pretty impressive and pretty desirable. Many of us would benefit from something like this today. So the question we asked as we watched this is, why doesn't that exist yet today? To analyze that, we looked at the interaction using three different frameworks. The distributed cognition for teamwork framework, the human agent teaming game analysis framework, and flows of power. We coded the transcript with multiple authors using these frameworks, and our data is available through osf.io. So first we use the distributed cognition for teams framework, which has two, two of the components in that. One of them is looking at information flow, how the information flows between characters in a team, as well as artifacts, which looks at related things and concepts like knowledge of the other person that's useful in the interaction. So we were interested in the modality of the communication, one of the things that stands out in this video is how much is a verbal com communication between the human and the agent. So when we counted those up, we noticed it was a fairly similar amount of communication with Mike talking to Phil, the agent, 15 times, Phil speaking back to Mike 12 times. But then there's this second layer of communication through another modality where we see Mike touching the tablet to interact with it, and we see Phil communicating with Mike through the screen, doing things like highlighting text on the screen to emphasize or bring attention to a certain point. And in that second set of modalities, touch and visual, the count was equal. So it's a very equal exchange between the two. Along with that dicot analysis,
We also are making note of certain uh, uh, capabilities and characteristics of the agent. So things like it's very, very deep knowledge of the user. It has this very strong situation awareness, this very sophisticated conversation ability, um, these really robust analytic skills, you know, creating these simulations and animations in real time. And it has this excellent smart display management where Phil always has the right thing on the screen in just the right place, no matter what. It seems to almost read Mike's mind and have just the right thing there for him. So when we looked at these different characteristics and capabilities and the relevant literature, we tried to classify why don't those capabilities exist in today's conversational agents. And we came up with these four different themes, or we grouped the constraints into these four themes um, of privacy, social and situational constraints, trust and perceived reliability, and technological constraints. And these categories are not unique to our research. When we looked at other research about barriers to um, adoption of new technologies, these sort of themes come up in other research as well. The second framework we used is the human agent team and game analysis framework. And this framework can be used to characterize agents um, in terms of things like their level of autonomy, their interaction style, their interdependence, and generally how they work with the humans around them. And to provide some broader context to this, we also classified Siri to have some comparison between this vision of an agent and an actual agent. And some of the things that jump out at us here as we compare the two is when we look at the Phil agent, it has more of this um, teammate type perspective where it is kind of a partner with the human. It has a high level of um, autonomy. It can initiate conversations. It can jump into conversations. Um, it, it participates in this sort of real-time human-like dialogue as though you're talking to another person. And in contrast, when we look at Siri and other conversational agents today, they're a little bit more like a tool responding to the human's requests and needs, but not necessarily showing that same initiative or ability to act on the user's behalf. The third framework we used is the flows of power framework. And this one is used to look at things like the, the social or power level distance between individuals. And so it's considering things like who are the people in this interaction? Where are they? How are they interacting? What materials do they have? What is their relative expertise? Um, what is their relative funding? Is one of them maybe paying the other? What does that look like? And so again, we looked at both Phil and Siri to have some comparison and, and broader context. And what jumps out at this in general is that Phil has a higher power level relative or a more equal power level relative to the human than Siri with its ability to proactively share information, initiate conversation, interrupt conversations. It has this really high awareness of the user's preferences and needs and, prefer um, and preferences. Um, and it can interact with other humans and with non-human entities. Presumably it's talking to other agents along the way too. Maybe Phil's talking to Jill Gilbert's agent. And then we thought the business model in that funding arena was kind of an interesting concept here too, in that we have these established funding models with agents today. So things like the agent uh, might be a value add feature within a system, or the agent might be collecting personal data and selling that to advertising to, to fund itself. But as we thought about the fill agent, we thought there might be a novel funding model that might be a little bit more appropriate for it. So with an agent like Phil, perhaps you might start with this base level model that has a high school education and it's trained to be an administrative assistant, but then for an additional fee, you can purchase these uploads. So maybe you purchase the liberal arts master's degree upload, and now it knows how to deal with uh, politics in the office, in higher education, and it knows how to help with research, or you might buy uh, upload that has medical knowledge so it can work in a doctor's office. And you can take this a step further and think, okay, maybe there's also a, a used market here for agents where maybe you're buying an agent that comes with five years of workplace experience. So you can imagine with that, perhaps when Mike, the professor in this video, is ready to retire, he might sell Phil as this used, experienced agent. So he might advertise Phil as having 
that liberal arts master's degree, 20 years of experience as an admin at UC Berkeley, two previous owners with their own various personalities and experiences and, you know, viewpoints and data uploads. And Phil also comes with this experience with certain tasks that those users have done, um, perhaps other experiences with the owners, like it's had an owner with depression and knows how to communicate with someone in that situation. Perhaps it's done a lot of wedding planning. You know, you can imagine a wide variety of, of skills that it might carry with it or carry that learning and knowledge. The challenge, of course, that would come up here is separating the personal and confidential information and sort of partitioning that from the task relevant information which would come up if you were to be selling a used agent or transferring it to another user. So circling back to the research question of why don't we have something like this today? We have these four categories of barriers, or op barriers to adoption that I mentioned previously. So if we look through those, the first one is this idea of trust and perceived reliability. So if I had this agent, I might be wondering, does Phil really know enough about my life and my relationships to communicate on my behalf? In the video near the end, we see Mike walking out of the office and he says to Phil, oh, if Kathy calls, tell her I'll be there at two o'clock. And presumably, Phil knows what to do if Kathy calls for a different reason, like to say, I'm sick, I'm not gonna make it. Phil, it, it seems to be trusted that, um, that Phil has some logic to communicate differently if things don't quite go according to plan. And then related to that is the social and situational category. So let's say I decided I do trust Phil to communicate on my behalf. Will my grandma be upset if she hears from Phil instead of me? Do I even want to be having these sort of personal conversations with my agent in this large open office or on the bus on the way to work? And then related to that is category of privacy concerns. So in the video, we see that Phil is always listening to Mike. Mike can turn around and mute Phil, but Phil is always listening. It's even implied that Phil might know a little bit about what Mike has been reading offline in terms of academic papers. So the question many of us would ask when we hear something like this in spite of the benefits is, how is that data being used and do I agree with that usage? The fourth category is technological constraints. So things like how do we train an agent to understand these ambiguous statements, to follow the conversation thread, or to efficiently collaborate on research the way we see Phil doing, almost like a, a research assistant. So a couple other topics came up as we were going through this analysis and literature that we thought were interesting. And one of them is this concept of asymmetry. And there's quite a bit of asymmetry between the Phil agent and Mike the human. And some of that is in how they communicate with the modalities of Phil manipulating the screen visually and Mike communicating with touch. And Phil can be muted by Mike, but in contrast, Mike is, Phil is always listening to Mike. And then there's this asymmetry in authority and initiative where Phil can take quite a bit of initiative, but he still is presumably acting on behalf of Mike's goals and commands and essentially supporting Mike whereas Mike is according, working according to his own goals and making those high-level decisions. And then you have this asymmetry to, to the human-agent relationship of this Phil the agent cannot be insulted, cannot be fatigued, whereas Mike has real physical and emotional needs that need to be respected. So Mike can be kind of rude to Phil and it doesn't matter because he's a computer, but Phil is probably expected to be respectful to Mike the user. And then the second topic that was interesting is this concept of mental models and terminology. So when we look at Phil, the agent, Phil is entrusted with private information and Phil is empowered to act on the user's behalf. And when we think about that, words that come to mind are things like assistant, butler, companion, very human roles. But in contrast to the humans filling those roles, Phil cannot be fatigued, Phil cannot be insulted, and Phil has these really inhuman technical capabilities. So what do we call something like that? How can we help ourselves and our users conceptualize this type of relationship? That's just one of the questions that we'll need to answer as we keep forging on in the world of human agent teaming. Thanks for listening.